Let's now discuss the selects in vitro assay for determining TF binding specificities. And so we'll just briefly talk about a few of the in vitro methods used to characterize TF binding affinities. And so the most classic one is called SELECTS, uh, which stands for a systematic evolution of ligands by exponential enrichment. So the idea of the select seq protocol is that you start out with a library of completely random DNA oligos, uh, and you basically incubate your transcription factor of interest with that library of initially random oligos. And what's going to happen is that in the first round of selects, your TF is going to bind to its target sequences of interest uh, in your random pool of uh, DNA oligos. And then what you're going to do is you're going to use an antibody to basically pull down those uh, fragments that are bound by your TF of interest. You're going to amplify those bound fragments. And then you're going to repeat the procedure of basically um, selecting fragments in a biased way using your TF of interest and amplifying those bound sequences. And after three to five uh, cycles through this process, you then sequence whatever fragments are left over. And presumably those fragments that are left are enriched for binding sites of your TF of interest. And so one of the main limitations of the SELECTS approach beyond throughput, which is again typically lower than in vivo methods like ChIP-seq, is that you kind of need to balance the number of select cycles that you use. And so on one hand, um, obviously every round of this, of these select cycles is going to help enrich your pool of DNA oligos for sequences that are bound by your TF of interest. Uh, on the other hand, what people have noticed is that, um, there's actually quite a bit of bias in terms of, uh, which sequences get amplified at the end. And so in principle, uh, you would hope that the number of oligos that are present after selection should be proportional to um, how frequently that you know that site is bound by your transcription factor of interest. In practice, what people find is that every round of select cycle basically leads to only a few of the like highest affinity binding sites being kept, and so a lot of the sequences that are bound by the TF but maybe in a lower concentration basically get washed out by the PCR amplification, and so. Um, you get kind of a biased set of uh, oligos at the end of selects if you use too many uh, if you use too many cycles, and so basically there's there's some you know fine art in terms of you know determining how many cycles exactly you should use for your experiment. One of the other popular in vitro based assays are called the protein binding microarrays, and so the idea of the PBMs is that you basically design a an array uh, that looks like the figure on the right, where basically on this array you have on the order of, for example, 44,000 different spots on this array where on each spot you fix a particular uh, DNA oligo. And the idea is that collectively across all of these 44,000 different spots, you want all of these sequences to collectively represent all of the different uh, possible binding sequences of a given TF. And so in this particular assay, what you do is you take this uh, PBM and you take your protein of interest and you wash it over the PBM and allow your TF of interest to bind to all of the different spots that contain fragments with its TF binding site. And so after you wash away uh, all of the unbound TFs, what you do then is you then use antibodies, which are uh, coupled with a particular fluorophore, and you wash the antibodies over the array, and then you use you do imaging to basically assess how much fluorescence uh, there is on any given particular spot on the array. And in principle, the amount of fluorescence you see is kind of proportional to the amount of TF binding uh, that happens in that particular spot. And so one of the amazing things about PBMs is that it turns out that even with just 44,000 different uh, DNA oligos, you can actually cover uh, all possible timbers. Uh, and so you can pretty efficiently uh, represent almost all possible uh, TF binding sequences on such a small array. Um, and so some of the major limitations of the PBMs are that 
Number one, uh, microarrays were actually kind of the popular approach to measuring uh, RNA expression uh, before sequencing became popular. And so PBMs kind of suffer from the same problems that gene expression measurements uh, suffered from before sequencing. And so that's number one, uh, that fluorescence-based approaches have generally poor uh, detection of uh, low binding in this case and poor detection of, uh, and basically saturation at the high end of, uh, of binding. And so what that means is that if a TF binds a particular DNA fragment at low concentrations, uh, that's pretty hard to pick up through fluorescence. And saturation at the high end basically means that um, at some point, uh, because of the way that the scanner works, basically there's an upper limit to how much TF binding you can observe before um, the signal intensity doesn't increase with the amount of TF binding. And so another way of saying that is that basically you would you would hope that the amount of fluorescence you see to spawn is proportional or linearly proportional with the amount of TF that's binding that fragment. But basically there's kind of like a S curve where uh, at some point um, your scanner can't distinguish higher intensities from your fluorophore. And so um, there's, there's basically an upper limit on the amount of TF binding you can detect. And so to briefly summarize the lecture so far, the two things that you mainly get out of uh, a TF binding assay is number one, uh, you get DNA sequences that correspond to fragments that tend to be bound by that particular transcription factor of interest. And those fragments that are, uh, that generally come from your control experiments uh, or your fragments that you know, either represent background genomic sequences uh, pulled down by a non-specific IP, uh, or in the case of your uh, oligo library for, for example, selects experiments, uh, they correspond to the oligos that you put in, but, uh, but were not basically selected uh, as part of the selects process. In the case of in vivo assays like ChIP-seq, uh, in addition, you get uh, locations across the genome uh, corresponding to where that particular transcription factor was presumably found to bind uh, in some kind of, in whatever cellular context you uh, did the cross-linking of the proteins to DNA in. And so uh, for the rest of the lecture, we'll mainly be talking about uh, what you can learn from the DNA sequences that you found were bound and not bound, uh, because that's common to both the in vitro and in vivo methods. And so a really important point to make is that because of the requirement for good antibodies and the requirement for a lot of uh, genomic material, what this means in practice is that a lot of the ChIP-seq experiments that have been done to date uh, are done on, for example, like uh, are done in vitro uh, in, for example, cancer cell lines that you can propagate indefinitely and generate a lot of the, you know, generate enough of the genomic material that you need to do ChIP-seq. And so to give an example of just how hard it is to perform ChIP-seq assays for a lot of transcription factors across a lot of different cell types, what I'm showing you here is basically a slide that uh, illustrates part of the uh, so-called experiment matrix of the ENCODE project. And so the ENCODE project is basically a super global consortium of people whose primary interests are in annotating the human genome in terms of where different regulatory encoding and non-coding elements are in the genome and under what conditions are they expressed or do they, what are their, you know, to characterize, they try to characterize their dynamics across as many different types of cells as possible. And so in this table here, the rows represent different cellular contexts. So a cellular context can be either a specific type of cell of origin or you know, multiple cells that have the same origin but are found under different contexts or different stimuli. And the columns here represent a subset of transcription factors uh, for which antibodies have been developed or um, you know are of strong interest and basically a green box here means that a particular transcription factor was assayed uh, using ChIP-seq 
um, under a specific cellular context. And so the main point here is that, so the ENCODE project is basically, as far as I'm aware, uh, one of the like largest consortium whose, you know, one of their primary goals is to basically chip seek as many TFs in as many cellular contacts as possible. And you can see basically from this table that most of the cellular contexts have not been profiled in terms of uh, TF binding for most of the transcription factors. And this is basically, you know, one of the largest chip seek producing consortiums on the planet. And so if they can, uh, if they're not able to, you know, assay most TFs in most cellular contexts, then, then, you know, that, that just goes to illustrate to you how challenging it is to uh, perform chip seek for a wide range of TFs in a wide range of cellular contexts. And so getting back to the this idea that both the in vitro and in vivo assays both give you a set of both bound fragments and in some sense unbound fragments or at least control fragments then one of the main questions that you know you can ask yourself is well what can you really learn from chip seek experiments and so given on the previous slide that uh that i mentioned that scaling up particularly in vivo but also in vitro uh, chip seek experiments to a lot of factors over a lot of cellular contexts is is pretty hard and and you know can't be done in the you know at least short term near future. Um, one of the primary goals of uh, performing chip seek experiments, one of them anyways, is that we would you know everybody basically generally wants to be able to build a model that in some sense, can accurately describe the DNA binding preferences of a transcription factor. Because imagine that you could, for example, just perform a chip seek assay for a given factor of interest in a few cellular contexts, and then learn some kind of model of uh, how that TF recognizes its cognate binding sequences across the genome. And then imagine that you could actually just take that model and then predict where that TF is going to bind in many other cellular contexts on a computer instead of you know, having to do the chip seek assay. Um, if you could build that kind of powerful model, then you know, that would kind of uh, you know, help you avoid the need to actually perform chip seek assays in all the different cellular contexts that you know, are possible. And so just to give you an idea, depending on how you define cell type, in the human body alone, there could be thousands of different types of cells, uh, never mind all the different contexts in which those cell types can be activated in different ways. And so you can just, you know, just, you know, that should hopefully give you a sense of, you know, how many types of cellular contexts you would actually have to do chip seek assays in to really understand how gene regulation operates in even humans um, in a wide range of contexts. And so uh, a related question is, um, whether you use the in vitro or in vivo methods uh, to identify bound fragments of a particular transcription factor, uh, one, pro one problem that I'll be skipping over here, in this lecture anyways, is basically the question of how exactly, you know, in a bound fragment um, in, in our genomic region, which you pulled down from ChIP-seq, for example, how exactly do you find the precise binding site of that transcription factor because the binding site of the transcription factor uh, quite often is only like six to eight base pairs, but the fragments that you pull down from say chip seek experiments tend to be like say 150 to, uh, you know, like 200, 300 base pairs. Um, and so how exactly you find, how exactly you find the true binding sites of the TFs within each genomic fragment is also a problem in, on its own uh, but we'll kind of skip over that detail for now. <clears throat> but suppose that you are able to, for each bound fragment, suppose you're able to identify precisely where that transcription factor is bound, and you were therefore able to perform an alignment to then line up uh, the corresponding positions of each TF binding site in an alignment, like I've shown you here on the left, <clears throat> in the table labeled uh, bound fragments. And so towards building a model of trying to understand how DNA um, binding works for a particular transcription factor, 
uh, one important question to ask is, well, <clears throat> when I look at this alignment of bound fragments, how do I how do I determine what the sequence specificity of that TF is at that particular position? Uh, you know, I could imagine that given um, how TFs bind to DNA, I could imagine that some positions are um, very important to TF uh, DNA recognition, and therefore there should be strong specificity of the TF uh, towards a particular base or a set of bases that position. And there might be positions where they're not so important for uh, at least direct TF DNA uh, contacts and recognition, and so they're less important. And so then that begs the question, well, how do you define importance? Right, and so one common way of defining importance uh, is uh, looking at a column in this alignment and asking the question, given the, all of the bases that I see in this column individually, uh, is the distribution of bases, so the percentage of bases that were A versus C versus C versus C, G versus T, uh, how different or surprising is this are the representation of these different bases relative to what I expect by chance. Um, and by expect by chance, I mean, uh, more specifically, if you were to look at the control fragments, which represents kind of your background expectation of you know, what kind of fragments are not identified by your particular TF of interest, um, how you know what bases do I typically see in these control fragments by chance? <clears throat> and so the idea here, the intuition here, is anyways, is that um, the more surprised we are about the bases that I see at a given position in my alignment of the bound fragments, the more information there is in that position, um, or the more important that position is. And so just to give a bit more of a concrete example, if, for example, in the control fragments that I pull down, if on average every base is found at 25% frequency, and then at a particular column in my alignment, if I see all Ts, that's probably a, you know a strong statistical um, strong statistical evidence that at that particular position in the binding site, uh, a T is preferred probably because of some kind of TFDNA recognition constraint.